Well, good morning, everyone. And good morning, Demis. I know it's like 1 a.m. in London, so we thank you for your solidarity and actually being jet lagged with us. I hope you're fully caffeinated like a room here in Singapore. <laughs> um, I am, I am. Good. Um, Demis, let me just start off with, you know, when we talk about AI and DeepMind, this is all about understanding the human brain and actually how it works. How far along are we in that journey? How much do we still not understand about our brains? So DeepMind, we, the way we approach building artificial intelligence is we try and take some inspiration from how the brain works. Um, and when we mean by inspiration, we're not trying to copy how the brain works, but we're sort of looking at the architectures and the algorithms and the representations the brain uses and then we're trying to get some hints and clues about how the brain produces intelligence and then we're trying to sort of recreate those capabilities uh, in our machines uh, so that effectively uh, our systems can think and learn for themselves so um, there's enough known about the brain that we can do that but we of course there are many open questions still about how the brain works but there's enough clues there that it's useful for building artificial intelligence. I mean, sh should I look at it in percentage wise? Are we like 5% you know, understanding <laughs> of our brain or, or is it like 30%? Um, I would say you know, it's, it's probably 20 to 30%, um, but it's you know, actually I think once we build AI, it will be helpful as a, a tool to, to finish understanding the brain. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that 20, 30% is still quite indicative and quite useful. Um, after all, the brain, the human brain, is the only existence proof we have in the universe that we know of um, that kind of general intelligence is possible. I want to talk about biology in a second, but how much do we actually interact with AI in our day-to-day -day lives without even realizing sometimes? Yeah, I, that's, that's right. I mean, artificial intelligence is embedded all around us now. Every time you use your mobile phone, you look at maps to find where you're going, you speak to it with your voice. Um, there's AI underpinning all of those everyday things now. Um, what's you know, recommended that you watch next on, on you know, Netflix or, or a streaming service, all of that has aspects of AI underlying those algorithms. So you know, we're touching artificial intelligence uh, you know, pretty much every, every minute by minute in our daily lives. I want to talk a little bit about biology. So your system AlphaFold is a solution to the protein folding system, a grand challenge in biology for the past 50 years. So why do you choose that thing to work on? Why biology and why now? So when we started DeepMind back in 2010, AI was you know, not fashionable like it is now. In fact, it was very much the opposite. It was very difficult even to, to, to raise some seed funding. And what we decided to do actually initially was to um, prove our algorithmic ideas, these ideas about building general learning systems that can learn for themselves directly from data and experience. We started to prove that out on games because it's very convenient as a kind of testing ground for our ideas. So we, um, we beat the world champion at Go famously with our program AlphaGo then chess, um, and then start a, a video game called StarCraft, strategic game called StarCraft. And the idea was ultimately always to eventually apply those algorithmic ideas to real world, massive real world challenges, um, in both in commercial challenges, but also in science. And AlphaFold, as you say, was our first big breakthrough in science, where um, we're able to uh, uh, predict the 3D structure of a protein, which um, goes a long way to determining what function it does in, in, in life and in our, in our bodies. And uh, we're able to predict the 3D structure directly from its one dimensional genetic sequence, uh, which normally would take years and years of very painstaking experimental work to find. And now we can do it in a matter of um, seconds. So Isomorphic Labs is also your new company with a mission to reimagine the entire drug discovery process. What can it achieve that humans can't? Is it pace or is it actually new discoveries? Well, we think that. Um, you know, AlphaFold is a kind of proof of concept that some of these uh, things, some of these aspects of biology and biochemistry that used to be done painstakingly in the lab, in the wet lab, um, and take many, many years and, and be very difficult types of experiments, a lot of those things we think are ready to be uh, tackled computationally or AI first. And, um, and, you know, we think that it's not just the protein structure, the structure of a protein, which of course is only one small aspect of, of what you need to do to, to discover a new drug or a cure for a disease. There are many, many other aspects that need to be, um, need to be cracked. Um, but we actually think uh, a lot of those uh, uh, components in that drug discovery process uh, are potentially amenable to computational and AI first methods. And what we wanna do with the new company is kind of accelerate investment in that area and really push that as far as it will go. And I think it could be a very exciting time in the next five plus years 
um, where you know we might see a new a kind of revolution in the way some of those um, steps are tackled um, much much more quickly and in the end um, deliver cures you know far faster than than the kind of 10 years average that it takes today so is that for the actual drug development or finding the drug or is it also safety because that, that's usually the process that takes the longest so can you achieve that quicker to make sure that it's safe and so maybe cut yeah the potentially time. both those things so so part of it is is is, is identifying the right target yeah. um then it's sort of you know um designing the right compound the right chemical compound to bind to that target um, and then also testing its properties, so making sure it's not toxic and has um, solu the right solubility and the right thermal properties and so on. Um, and we think that AI could potentially predict many of those properties. So then when it, it goes to, you know, to the point where it's going to clinical trial, then you have a much higher confidence and percentage chance of getting through that cl clinical trial. Uh, and of course, that would ex and it would also accelerate that whole um, discovery process as well by potentially many years. Um, Demis, people who work in technology or like health tech often say about a culture clash between software developers that are interactive, want to go fast, and maybe, you know, drug development, which has more checks and balances. How do you make sure that there's not a culture clash? Yeah, no, so I think, of course, um, there are many reasons for, for medicine and, 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 and pharma to be like it is. And obviously, um, you know, you have to carefully check all of your experiments. Um, before you uh, uh, obviously distribute anything, but I think there are many steps in the in the early discovery process um, before you're anywhere close to getting to market or doing the clinical trials and and regulations that come with that and, and all those kinds of things where um, it's purely sort of scientific in the lab and it's those steps that I think we're looking to see if they can be accelerated uh, and and enhanced and helped with um, very com you know sophisticated deep computational and AI methods, much like AlphaFold. Google's previous pharma foray, um, you know, have struggled. I'm thinking of the partnership with Sanofi Aventis fizzling in 2019. There was, you know, the contact lenses that could actually check uh, whether you had diabetes or not. What will you do differently with this project? Yeah, this is a very different sort of project to other things. Um, actually, I think that's going on in pharma in general, where we're really focusing on the computational side of things. That's our expertise from DeepMind. That's what the expertise of the new company, Isomorphic Labs, will have, is um, really doubling down on this idea of modeling aspects of biology. How much of biology can we computationally model? Can we understand with information systems? I think at, at, its, at its most fundamental level, biology uh, is an information processing system. You know, you can obviously DNA has often been called as a sort of code, you know, really like a code. Um, but I think many other aspects of biology, um, our cells, proteins, and other things, can actually best be understood as uh, information processing systems. And if that's the, the, that's the right hunch, then um, a lot of these systems might be modelable and predictable with machine learning methods. So it's a really different um, kind of approach to, say, building devices or yeah. um, building wet labs and other more traditional approaches to things like drug discovery and medicine. Um Demis, are people at DeepMind concerned about the powerful AI that you're creating being controlled by a single entity? Do you feel comfortable with that? And are, you know, what are the checks and balances that, that you want to make sure are always in place? Yeah, we, we're very comfortable. I mean, um, we've been now part of the Alphabet group for, for nearly eight years. Um, we're very, very proud of that. They give us a ton of support. We're an independently sort of run subsidiary, so we have our own roadmap, our own um, research agenda. Um, our own culture um, and all of that is and you know obviously we're based in London um, and so uh, we have a lot of freedom to operate uh, how we think best to sort of deliver our mission uh, of you know solving intelligence and using it to advance science and benefiting humanity and so we're sort of laser focused on that and um, we sort of see it as the best of all worlds really so we get to still sort of be like a nimble I still regard us as a startup even though uh, we're a dozen years in, still have plenty to do in our mission, um, but we're backed by, you know, this really big entity, supportive entity. And, um, and another thing is we have a lot of collaborations with Google on the commercial side in terms of our technology being embedded now in hundreds of Google products. I mean, pretty much any Google product you use will have some aspect of DeepMind's technology um, under, the, under the hood. Um, and, uh, and in terms of sort of uh, ethics questions and other things, we've always had um, the ethical use of AI as a fundamental uh, uh, building block of DeepMind from the very beginning. 
we plan for success. So we thought even back in 2010, when no one else pretty much was working on AI, we already envisaged how powerful the technology could be, um, an extraordinarily powerful technology with extraordinary opportunities, but also some risks that come with that. And so we had that in mind from the beginning, and uh, we've embedded that in everything we do. You know, we have internal uh, uh, ethics committees and other things that check uh, and look through with the researchers in partnership with them, um, every research that we work on um, and deploy. And, um, and Alphabet and Google itself has also publicly um, uh, declared their, their sort of AI principles, yeah. which uh, we were a big part of um, helping draft. And, and uh, obviously we, we subscribe to those principles as well. Are, are there lessons to be learned actually from the social media industry about risks and our reputation? And is there anything holding AI back? Are we, you know, do we fear it or are we curious about it? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at the, I, I, obviously it's a very different field from the, from the social media um, uh, field and industry, but there are some lessons there, which is I think we, we should take on board about um, building very powerful technologies, you know, perhaps building them with good intent in mind and, and some good theories at the outset of what, what they would be capable of. Um, but then when actually you realize your, um, uh, uh, your ambitions, you also need to think at that point that before it happens, what the unintended consequence might be. And, um, and I think for some, some, for powerful things, you know, like social media, but also like AI, um, uh, you know, you need to think about that ahead of time. Uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea to sort of, um, to use an anachronism of like, you know, move fast and break things. Um, you know, that's maybe appropriate for things like games or apps or, you know, things like that. But I think for when you're talking about powerful new technologies and, si and powerful new science, I think a scientific method and a scientific approach of sort of thoughtful reflection, uh, thoughtful progress, um, uh, critiquing everything you do, um, submitting your work to peer review, outside peer review, which is obviously the norm scientific method. Um, all of those things help science to be very robust and why it works so brilliantly. Um, and I think uh, the scientific method is more the correct method and approach, I think, yeah. for um, building these types of powerful technologies. How much can AI actually contribute to climate goals? Yeah, so actually, we, I've just come back from COP26, probably like many of you, and I, I, I um, was talking there about the many ways I think AI can actually be uh, a really big contributor uh, to helping with the climate crisis. Um, I think there's at least three ways. Uh, one is optimizing existing infrastructure. So um, we did that already at Google, where we um, reduced the, the amount of cooling uh, 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 the energy, the cooling systems within the Google data centers used by about 30%. Uh, we've now generalized that to, um, and it's available on Google Cloud for um, all building controls. Uh, and we're running a bunch of pilots and it looks like we can save 20 to 30% of the energy used by uh, an office building uh, through more efficiently controlling the air, air, you know, air conditioning and, and heating and so on. So, um, you know, that could be huge if you think about rolling that out globally. Um, it's about 6% of the world's emissions are, are building office uh, emissions. So, um, and I think AI could optimize many existing infrastructure, which would almost be for free because it's just software on top of existing um, infrastructure. Secondly, I think it's like better, making better predictive models with climate um, and the weather. We've just um, uh, built a, a, a rainfall prediction system that's better than anything the UK Met Office has. Um, and then thirdly, it would be accelerating new technologies. So things like material science, um, also protein, the works we on proteins could help potentially, um, and things even like fusion and plasma containment we've worked on. So um, I think all of those three areas could be accelerated by um, AI. Um, Demis, what can contribute most to the acceleration of AI adoption and capability? And I don't know whether, for example, for alpha folds or isomorphic labs, you have a time frame on which you want to, you know, solve certain drug situations. Yeah, we always have like we always have sort of near-term plans, medium plans, and then very long-term plans. We've had that from the beginning. We had a kind of 20-year plan when we started with DeepMind, which we're about halfway through now, and 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 on time. The same with isomorphic. With I with, with AlphaFold, we've already open sourced that and released it free for any use, commercial or academic because we felt that was actually the quickest way to get the maximum benefit for the scientific community and humanity. And uh, we actually partnered up with the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, uh, based in Cambridge, and they build the best uh, database tools for the biological research community. And uh, we hosted all the predictions 
for um, all 20,000 proteins in the, in the human body. So that's the, the human proteome it's called, it's sort of um, equivalent to the human genome, but, but, but with proteins. And uh, that's all available along with 20 other model organisms. So over 300 um, structure predictions are on that database. And um, we've been really amazed and, and, and pleasantly sort of surprised by how quickly uh, the entire biological research community uh, has adopted that. In fact, 300,000 scientists have already accessed the database, which I think is, I think there's only about 300,000 biological researchers in the world. So perhaps every single one of them has already looked up their favorite protein in, in our database. Um, so it's amazing to see that kind of impact. Uh, and then isomorphic is going to sort of look more carefully, specifically at drug discovery process. So things like small molecule design, um, binding affinities, so more directly to do with the drug discovery process, whereas AlphaFold was more about the um, fundamental biological research questions. Um, Demis, how, a final question, how does AI, first of all, fit in the metaverse, and what's your AI utopia in, in five, ten years? <laughs> Yeah, so AI and you know metaverse is actually a funny thing because um, I feel it's gone full circle with the metaverse. I used to start my career before DeepMind uh, designing computer games and writing AI for computer games, and obviously the metaverse is a sort of next evolution of of gaming in some ways. Um, and I think AI's got a big place to part to play there in terms of creating compelling avatars or characters within the metaverse world that you can converse with and interact with and perhaps um, advance stories and other things with. So I think actually there's a, there's a huge amount that AI is going to bring to the metaverse. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I hope, my hope for AI is that we'll, we'll use it to, over the next decade, we'll start seeing it really materially contributing to some of the biggest grand challenges facing us as a society from, you know, disease to climate. Demis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.